This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on portfolio management and the reading on portfolio risk and return, part two. Recall that in part one, we had an introduction to portfolio standard deviation and portfolio risk. This is really just a continuation of that conversation. You may have noticed that both part one and part two were written by the same guy. And there's a part one and a part two, mostly because there's just so much to talk about. And so it was easy to split this into two parts, but it's really just uh, one, one big part. And as you look through the LOSs, you'll get the sense that, uh, hey, we, we've done some of this before and it is a continuation. Those of you who did watch the recording for part one, you may have been just a little disappointed at the end because I kind of glanced through capital market line and risk-free rate, and I knew that we were going to go ahead and emphasize that in the beginning of the second reading. So we'll do more. We'll do more of that. We'll continue our conversations on the different types of risk, and then we'll switch over into uh, one of my favorite topics out there, the capital asset pricing model. And then I think this is probably super important, that last LOS, calculate and interpret those performance measures. And this will not only be important for level one, but we'll go ahead and do this uh, in levels two and three. So let's do just a quick review from part one. I want you to focus on that green curve called the efficient frontier. This was from Harry Markowitz in 1952. Let me just remind you, I called this an efficient locus of points in which risk, in this case, standard deviation, notice on the horizontal axis, that the risk is minimized at each given level of return, there's expected portfolio return on the vertical axis. Now, this is important. That relationship in the Harry Markowitz world is nonlinear. It, it, it is a curve. And so that sounds like a really great question to me. You know, tell me about Harry Markowitz. You can talk about risk and expected return, but it is, uh, it is a curve. It's a nonlinear relationship. Now, a year or so later, and it probably even occurred in 1952, there was another dude named James Tobin who said something like, hey, what happens if we throw a risk-free rate into that? model with the Harry Markowitz. And uh, the two of them, you know, kind of combined to form the CML. Notice the capital market line. That's the blue line. And, and it is a line. And so the uh, vertical intercept is the risk-free rate of interest. You can't see it over there on this graph. But of course, if we have zero standard deviation, we, we have to have zero risk. But what, a, what adding a risk-free security to the Harry Markowitz model does is that it turns the relationship between risk and expected return into a line. And that becomes the capital market line. Notice that star point right there is the only point that is on both the Harry Markowitz efficient frontier and the capital market line. That starred point is known in the academic world as the tangency portfolio. And then, of course, uh, all good uh, PhD students will have to uh, derive uh, the simple slope between the market portfolio and the tangency portfolio and prove that they're the same thing. So the important thing for you candidates is that that star is the market portfolio. And what we know is that everyone will own the market portfolio and then they will either move downward to the left by buying treasury bills or bonds or notes, or individual investors will move upward and to the right by using things like margin accounts or derivative securities, or maybe we could even extend that into alternative investments. And so here's the punchline. This is what I said to you at the end of that last recording, is that the capital market line becomes the new efficient frontier. So remember that, great exam question. Capital market line is, uh, is a set of efficient points between standard deviation and portfolio return. All right, let's go ahead and look at that very first LOS, implications of combining a risk-free asset. All right, so this is exactly what I did. Now, what we need to do is make sure 
that we differentiate between the capital allocation line and the capital market line. But let's look at that first bullet point there. <clears throat> Notice after the comma, it reads, we can improve the return risk characteristics of the portfolio resulting in a better trade-off. What does that mean? Well, that means exactly what I said earlier that the entire green efficient frontier now becomes inefficient with the exception of the market portfolio. So we are improving. What does that sentence tell us? Improving the risk return characteristics. So what we can do is we can combine risky assets and the risk free rate, and that results in what's known as the capital allocation line. Now, what we can do with this capital allocation line is we can say something like, oh, let's go ahead and see how much we can invest in the risk-free asset. So look over in uh, the bottom right uh, over there, you have 0%. So we have 0% invested in the market portfolio or a portfolio of well-diversified risky assets, and that means 100% is invested in the risk-free asset. And then we can go to 20, and there's 50%, and 75, and 100, and then you can get to 125% by, by using leverage. And so the capital al allocation line is a combination of the risk-free asset and uh, all of the risky assets. Now, the capital market line is the unique part of the capital allocation line where everyone owns the market portfolio. And so here's this graph once again. And in fact, that first diamond point tells us capital market line, a special case of the capital allocation line. The risky portfolio is the market portfolio. And of course, the easy thing to do is just to say something like, oh, you know what? The market portfolio, let's just use the S&P 500 index as a proxy for the market portfolio. And academics and professionals have been doing that for you know long, long, long time. But pure academics will go ahead and say to you something like, you know what, we, we're really not quite sure what the market portfolio looks like. It ought to contain every risky asset that is out there, including stocks and bonds and alternative investments and collectibles and all these kinds of things. But that's probably not too terribly realistic. And so notice that second diamond point. The investor defines the market portfolio as its domestic stock market index. So of course, the S&P 500 is a logical proxy for the US domestic stock market index. Now, some professionals like to extend that to uh, the entire global uh, market, but I think if you just remember domestic stock market in index, I think we'll be okay. All right, explain capital allocation line and capital market line, and we did a good job of that here in the first few minutes of this slide deck. But of course, let's go ahead and do some mathematics. So let's go ahead and look at what a return on a portfolio looks like from a mathematical standpoint if we invest in the risk-free asset. So look in that equation, there's the, uh, the R sub F, and then we invest in the market portfolio and there's the R sub M. And so all we're gonna do is take a weighted average. So weight, weight one is the weight in the risk-free asset. When I do this in my classes, I always call weight one, I call it uh, weight F, so that students know it's the weight in the risk-free asset. And then I do weight M, but here the, the Institute just wants you to do weight one and one minus weight one. So if you have 75% in the risk-free asset, then you have one minus that or 25% in the market portfolio. And then here's where it gets a little bit cool. And this is why the relationship turns from being a curve into a line, because if we want to calculate the variance, or in this case, that equation in the gray box is the standard deviation of the portfolio. Remember, the standard deviation of a risk-free rate uh, of a risk-free asset is zero. So we don't have to worry about that at all. In addition, the correlation coefficient between the market portfolio and the risk-free asset is zero. So we don't have to worry about that term at all. All we have is uh, the risk uh, of the portfolio is equal to the weight in the market portfolio times the standard deviation. 
of the market portfolio. And so look at the, the blue box we have down there, a little bit of a, uh, of, of a sentence describing what I was saying to you earlier. Now, here is the capital market line equation we're going to start with. Here, let me just go back here quickly. So imagine that risk-free rate is on the vertical axis intercept term. So we're going to start with the risk-free rate of interest, and then we're going to add something to it, right? Because the return on the expected return on, uh, let's say, the S&P 500 index or the domestic stock market index has to start with the risk-free rate of interest. And then we have to add something. And what is it that we're going to add? Well, we're going to add the return, the expected return on that market portfolio minus that risk-free rate. That's called, and that's referred to regularly, both by academics and professionals as a market risk premium. So you might wanna put that in your notes there, right there in the numerator, market risk premium. Then we're gonna divide by the standard deviation of the market portfolio. And we're gonna multiply that by the standard deviation of the uh, portfolio in question. Sometimes it's the market portfolio and sometimes it's not. Uh, notice that if we are considering the market portfolio, then the standard deviation that that, that ratio turns out to be uh, turns out to be one. Uh, the reason that the Institute puts this together in this particular form is because if you look inside the parentheses, expected return on the market, minus the risk-free rate of interest divided by the standard deviation of the market portfolio, you get something. And what did I say to you in that slide deck or in the LOS is that that very last LOS that relates to performance measures, the, this is super important. So you should be thinking, hey, doesn't that look an awful lot like the, uh, like the Sharpe ratio? We'll talk about that in, in just a few minutes. All right, let me just remind you of what we did back in part one. Look at the illustration down at the bottom right. We said that some we said something like, hey, we know that diversification reduces risk. So let's go ahead and try to prove that from an illustration standpoint. So we've got standard deviation on the vertical axis. Let's just call that portfolio risk and the number of assets in the portfolio uh, along the vertical axis. So we start with one and we go to two and 10 and 20 and 30 and 50. I did all this back in the uh, part one, but that green line represents the relationship between the number of assets in the portfolio and portfolio risk. So it's downward sloping. So note that at the very beginning, the slope is pretty steep. So we get really, really super benefits of diversification. And let me go ahead and remind you, we talked about this in part one, that that diversification is primarily the result of correlation coefficients between and among those first assets that are less than exactly 1.0. But note, as we add more and more assets to the portfolio, that slope kind of flattens out until it becomes parallel to the horizontal axis. And so that's the relationship between securities in the portfolio and portfolio risk. We call that total risk, and we know that we measure that by standard deviation. So what did I say to you earlier? I said that total risk has two components, and let's get back up to the slide. So here we have systematic risk. This is the non-diversifiable component. Remember that definition I gave you, systematic risk is the variability in asset returns due to changes in the economy. Well, there are some examples, inflation risk, interest rate risk, business cycle risk, all of those risks that we've talked about throughout level one. Non-systematic risk, which interestingly enough is how the CFA Institute and the reading refers to this, I always learned it as unsystematic risk. So if I let that unsystematic risk term slip in there, you know, non and un, they mean pretty much the same thing. So look at that first uh, arrow point, asset specific risk. This can be diversified away. Let me remind you of that definition I gave you in the part one, uh, unsystematic risk, non-systematic risk is the variability in security returns due to asset specific, if these are equity securities, firm specific uh, variables, things like a recalled product, uh, think of 2022 with the shortage 
in baby formula and employee strike, all the stuff that we learned about in, uh, uh, in our corporate finance reading, dividends, mergers, uh, all, all that good stuff. So this is, uh, you know, we, we can't ever uh, try to imagine what the Institute is thinking when it creates the exam questions, but man, you gotta think that there's gotta be a question on definitions and differences between systematic and non-systematic risk. Look at the light bulb point that we have down the bottom left. Investors are only compensated for bearing systematic risk. So what we need, uh, what we need is a measure. We need a measure of that level of systematic risk. So we know, we know that total risk is measured by standard deviation. And now we're learning in this part two that systematic risk is measured by beta. And that is super cool. And beta has a lot of pressure on it to capture all of those pieces of information. All right, so let's take a little bit step just sideways here and ask ourselves the following question. What we're trying to do is we're trying to determine what is a reasonable rate of return for maybe individual stocks, but also maybe for portfolios of stocks. How can we predict what's going to happen in the future? And this is what we use these return generating models for. Notice in the bolded, we have up there an estimate of the return of a particular security or extended to portfolios of securities as well, given certain input parameters. So what did I just say to you back here? Let me, let me go back. Uh, uh, systematic risk variability in security returns due to factors that are a part of the macro economy. Well, let's go ahead and come up with a multi-factor model. So a multi-factor model is one that says something like, hey, you know what? Let's suppose that we have diversified portfolios and our stock, our security is part of that diversified portfolio. Well, then the variability in returns is probably due to things like inflation, right? Macroeconomic variables, fundamental variables or statistical variables. And so the important thing is that these factors are correlated with the returns to the individual security. So look at that third bullet point there. By estimating the economic factors and understanding the relationship, I'm just gonna pause here and editorialize as, as a true academic and a true appreciator. Is that a word? Uh, uh, I have true appreciation for what the CFA Institute is trying to do here from an academic standpoint. I love that. Understanding the relationship between and among the factors and the security returns. So what we can do is we can use this multi-factor model that includes things like changes in GDP. It includes things like exchange rates. It includes things like inflation. Think of 2022 and the massive levels of inflation that occurred throughout the world and in particular um, the United States. We can use, how about uh, oil prices and gasoline prices? We can use those factors to help us predict what's going to happen to a company like uh, like Harley Davidson uh, or Apple. Now, before we got to these multi-factor models, we had to go way, way back in time to what's known as the single index model. All we're doing here is we're taking a single index. <laughs> it uses the market factor you know, maybe the market portfolio as the only factor to try to help us uh, predict what's going to happen on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And so look at the second bullet point there. The model's equation is the capital market line. And notice what we've done in green there. We've uh, highlighted that. You know, what did we call that? Maybe that's a slope. Maybe that's the sharp ratio. And so what we're doing is using a measure of performance to help us predict what's going to happen on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And then notice going from where we have the green to the all black, all we did is some a uh, little bit of algebra. We took the risk-free rate over to the other side. 
and we pulled the ratio out so that you can actually see the standard deviation of the individual asset I over the market portfolio. And look underneath there, the factor weight or the loading factor of sigma sub I divided by sigma sub M reflects the ratio of the individual security, maybe even sometimes portfolio risk to the market risk. And so there at the bottom, you see what we can do by going to, let's say, Yahoo Finance and typing in uh, a ticker symbol like Harley Davidson. So what we can do is download uh, stock prices weekly or monthly or even daily stock prices for Harley Davidson. And then we can do the same thing for, let's say, the S&P 500 index as our proxy for the market index. And we can estimate a set of linear parameters that so we can run a regression analysis. And that's what we get. So there's the single index market model there at the bottom where the return on an individual asset is equal to some intercept. And there's the definition of the intercept down in the bottom left, uh, plus uh, the return on the market portfolio. And then, oh man, there's that beta that I was talking about in the previous slide. Beta is our measure of systematic risk. How sensitive is our Harley Davidson stock returns to changes in the market returns? And then of course, I'm hoping, now I've got my fingers crossed, I'm hoping that all of you candidates appreciate the little plus sign over to the right and notice that we have bolded this in red. There's the disturbance term or the error term that results whenever you perform a regression analysis. Remember that this model is not perfect, so there has to be an error term. And so what do we want? Do we, we, do we want an error term that's this big? Well, if we have an error, can you guys see my hands all the way out here? If we have an error term that's this big, then we just need to take our shovel and pick up the single index market model and just throw it right out uh, onto the garbage truck. What we want is that error term to be, you know, pretty small so that the model is relatively accurate. Now, what we can do is we can go ahead and use this single index market model to help us go back and uncover the relationship between total risk, non-systematic risk, and systematic risk. So what I want you to do is I want you to uh, look down at the second equation under the third bullet point. There is the variance, right? It's sigma squared of the individual security, I, and that is equal to beta, there's our measure of systematic risk, squared, times the variance of the market portfolio plus, plus the variance of the error term. All right, so are you ready for this? So what's on the left-hand side of the equal sign? The left-hand side is total risk. What did I say to you just a few moments ago and back in part one recording is that that has two components. It has systematic risk component. Here we're calling it systematic variance. Look at that. That's beta squared times the variance of the market. So there's systematic risk. And then non-systematic risk, which is the variance, right? Sigma squared, the variance of the error term. So what I want to do is I want to go back to, what do I want to go back to? I want to go back to this graph and really all I said to you earlier was, hey, standard deviation has two components. It has systematic risk and non-systematic risk. I could have been making that up, right? But of course, as good academics and as good professionals, we're going here and now we're proving it mathematically. And so you can easily go and all of uh, all finance professors who have PhDs in finance at one time in their life, they had to go from that capital market line to this equation right here. And now let's go ahead and skip up. You know, what we can do is we can drop that covariance term because the correlation coefficient between, between the return on the market portfolio and the error term is going to be zero. So you can throw that term out. And that what, that's what leads us to this mathematical proof of total variance is equal to systematic risk plus non-systematic risk. Go ahead and take a deep breath and say, you know what, Jim, that was really cool stuff. All right, what have I said to you about beta at this point? Beta is the measure of systematic risk. Uh, I've also used the term sensitivity. So there's the first two, uh, two bullet points. 
Uh, almost all securities out there are going to have a positive beta, which means that when you know the economy expands and the S&P 500 index goes up, then almost all stocks goes up. Go, almost all stocks increase in value. So most stocks have positive betas. Uh, every once in a while, I'll tell the story about writing my dissertation. I computed the beta for about, I can't even remember, 1,600 or 1,800 different companies. And uh, of those, I think, let's, let, me, let me just pick a number and say 2,000. Uh, of those 2,000, I would say 95% of them were between uh, zero and two. I had a handful that were greater than two, and I had a handful that were negative, and they were probably just negative. You know, I can't even remember my time frame. I probably did three years worth of daily uh, data, and so I had, I had some negative betas. So uh, the reading mentions this, and I give you a little bit of a story about my dissertation so that if you see a negative beta on the exam, don't have a heart attack and say, oh, there's no way this can happen because, you know, it can, but probably not over a decade or so. And so just remember, betas, you know, most of them move in tandem with the market portfolio, but some over shorter time periods might have a negative beta. And so there's the formula for beta, and notice the LOS says calculate, so you're going to have to remember this. So beta is really just a standardized covariance, uh, but the equation that the reading uses is this one right here. So we're going to take the correlation coefficient times the risk of the asset. So go ahead and look over on the far uh, right of the equal sign. So there's the row of I sub M, so that's the correlation coefficient between the individual asset I and the market portfolio times the standard deviation of I, and then we divide that by the standard deviation of the market portfolio. Look at that blue box down there. An asset with zero correlation to the market will have a beta of zero, and that should make perfect sense just from an intuition standpoint, but of course, from a mathematical standpoint, it even makes more perfect sense. Can, if you have perfect sense, can you have more perfect sense? I don't know, but put a zero in the numerator and you have a beta of zero. All right, let's do a couple of quick examples here. The first two are, are really super, super simple. Given a standard deviation of the market of 20%, what is the beta of a $10 million treasury bill? Well, that's kind of a trick question, right? That's gonna be zero risk-free. Uh, let's took a look at the second one, standard deviation of 15, correlation coefficient of zero. What's the value of beta? Well, there's another trick question, it's zero. But if you look at some of the uh, multiple choice questions at the end of the reading, um, the institute and the author of this reading are very, very clever. What they'll do is they'll give you a table with, let's say, three assets, and they'll have things like standard deviation and correlation coefficient and something, and maybe one will be blank. And they'll ask you, you know, these kinds of questions. So be prepared to put zero as, as one of your answers. But I think the third question is probably more likely. So we've got standard deviation of 15%, correlation of eight, market standard deviation of 10%. And so let's go ahead and use that equation from before. Uh, what are we saying here? 80% of 15 divided by 10. So that gives us a beta of 1.2. Let's go ahead and interpret this beta. What does that mean? That means, are you ready for this? This is what I do to my students all the time. I say something like, look, if the S&P 500 index is this big and it goes to be this big, you know, let's say over a week or a month, what that means? That means the market has gone up. If you have a stock that has a beta of exactly one, then your stock was this big and then it'll go up by the exact same bigness. That's not a word either, right? But if it has a beta of 1.2 and the S&P goes like this, well, your stock is going to go like that. It's, did I do that right? Who knows? But what I'm saying is that you're going to expect 20% more of a sensitivity or of a reaction because you have more systematic risk. So a beta of 1.2 means that uh, if the S&P 500 goes up by 10%, then you can reasonably expect your asset or your portfolio to go up by more than 10%. Now, you can't do a one-to-one -one relationship and say exactly 20% uh, more. What you need is something like the capital market line or the capital asset pricing model, which is what we're going to do right now. So what have we done? We've done capital market line, which is all about standard deviation 
on that horizontal axis. And it is a line, right? We went through all the reasonings of why the capital market line is a line. But now let's go ahead and switch gears and say something like, well, we know that all investors are going to own well-diversified portfolios. So just by definition, they have, those investors have eliminated the non-systematic risk component. So all they're left with is systematic risk. And what did I say earlier? Beta is our measure of systematic risk. So wouldn't it be awesome if we had a model that looked something like the capital market line, but instead of using standard deviation, it uses beta, the relevant measure of systematic risk. And of course, this is what William Sharp, among others, taught us back in 1964. And William Sharp said something like, all right, let's try to figure out what a reasonable return is for an individual security. So that's why we have expected return on individual security I on the left-hand side of the equal sign. William Sharp said the same thing that Harry Markowitz and James Tobin said. Let's go ahead and start with the risk-free rate of interest. Let's add a market risk premium, just like we did back then. So there's the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate of interest. But instead of, remember we called those the factor loadings or whatever that term was, the weightings in a few slides ago, instead of weighting that market risk premium by that factor loading ratio of standard deviations, William Sharp said, hey, let's just use beta here. And so there's the beauty, there's the capital asset pricing model. And this, of course, won William Sharp the Nobel Prize in economics. Why do we like the capital asset pricing model? Because it's simple, because it's intuitive, and it because it, it gives us a reasonable estimate of expected return. Now, let me put my academic hat on here just for one minute and say something like, you know, this was awesome stuff in 1964, and it's still awesome stuff in the 2020s. However, it's not a perfect model. It has lots and lots of value to it, but there are pockets to it that can be improved. And the reason that it can be improved is, be, is because that William Sharp, among all those uh, and, uh, founding fathers of modern portfolio theory, they made lots and lots of assumptions back then that may not accurately and completely reflect the reality of life today. So what were those assumptions here? Investors are risk averse, which simply means that uh, in order for you to motivate an investor for taking a little bit of risk, marginal risk, you've got to compensate them with extra return. That's all risk aversion means. Uh, utility maximizing agent. What that means is that, and then think of it this way, that an investor has this amount of money, say it's $100, and this investor wants to retire in 20 years and wants to retire with a million dollars. And so this utility maximizing agent is an investor who says something like, look, I have $100 today. What I wanna do is I wanna maximize my return over that time period so that I have the most amount of capital on the day I retire. And so utility maximizing is an intertemporal, it's an over time kind of a model in which investors say something like, look, I've got this right now. I'm not going to consume it. I'm not going to go to the farmer's market and buy a whole bunch of Honeycrisp apples. I'm going to forego current assumption today so that I can save and invest so that I'm way better off tomorrow or when, on, when I retire. Now here's, look at that third bullet point there. This is a big one there. Oh, rational. Every investor analyzes available information correctly, not only correctly, but completely and accurately and without error to arrive at rational decisions. And that's a big, uh, that's a big assumption. What I'll do for you guys is that when we get to the behavioral finance uh, reading, I will go ahead and compare a rational investor to a behavioral investor. And then the question is, if there are enough behavioral investors out there in the marketplace, then the capital asset pricing model and beta might not capture all the risk that's out there. But that's probably a conversation for another day.
Uh, yeah, here's a second assumption here. Markets are frictionless. You know, remember when you're in second grade or fifth grade or whatever grade and you hear of that perpetual motion machine that goes on forever and ever. And I just kept banging my head thinking, how can something go on forever and ever? Doesn't it have to stop? Well, if there's no friction, then I guess it doesn't ever have to stop. But I don't really know what I'm talking about. So frictionless markets mean that you really don't have to pay like a transaction cost. There's no bid ask spread. Uh, there's no government out there uh, reaching out into your portfolio and saying, I'm going to take all of this stuff. Uh, look at that first one. You can have all sorts of uh, short selling. You can have unlimited short selling. So you could you could go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and you could you could borrow, let's say, a trillion shares of Harley Davidson and go sell those. I mean, you know, really, can you do that? Um, boy, restrictions on short selling, however, can impact CAPM by introducing an upward bias. Okay, that, that should make sense then. Uh, investors plan for the same single holding period return. Okay, so uh, uh, what this initial assumption was is that we have one period, maybe it's a year, but then uh, some other people after William Sharp came along and said, you know what, we can do this for two years or five years or 10 years. And so this is not really, uh, it's not really a big deal. Here's a big one here. Um, I want you to think about this. Uh, every investor who shows up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, here, let me go back here just quickly here. What do we say rational? So they process information accurately, correctly, and completely. And then they show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with the same brain power. Asset valuations are identical, same optimal portfolio. So they all have the same expectations about Harley Davidson's future. Wow. All right. All investments are infinitely divisible. This sounded like a big one back in 1964. But nowadays, you know, you can go uh, online and you can buy, you know, you can buy just one share. Can you buy a half a share? Probably not. Can you buy six and a half shares or uh, or? five sevenths or two sevenths of a, of, a, of a share of stock? Probably not. Investors are price takers. And so uh, nobody can show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and influence uh, the price either, either one way or another. But uh, I promise you, and of course it doesn't happen like this, but I tell my students to envision a mutual fund manager who has a tremendous inflow of capital uh, during the course of a day and shows up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with a billion dollars in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and, 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 you know, if the mutual fund manager shows up with all of this cash and gets in the, I want to buy line, well, the, you know, people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, the designated market maker is going to say, whoa, my price is going to skyrocket. And so, uh, you know, mutual fund managers, they kind of do this, you know, they try to slip it in there, as Jerry Seinfeld said once, uh, uh, unnoticed. <clears throat> so let's get back to the reality of the capital asset pricing model. Of course, if we have the capital market line, we can have a line with the capital asset pricing model. And so SML is just a picture of the capital asset pricing model. So note that this looks an awful lot like what we did for CML, but here's the big difference. Notice on the horizontal axis, we don't have standard deviation down there. We have beta. So that's got to be some question here. Security market line is assumes investors hold well diversified portfolios. So beta is the appropriate measure of risk. Capital market line makes no assumption about diversification and they use standard deviation um, as the measure of risk. But it is a line, SML and CML. So they're, they're both lines. They both measure the relationship between risk and expected return. But the difference, of course, is in the uh, decision of which risk to use. A little bit of a review. There's the capital asset pricing model. There's our formula for beta. Uh, boy, although similar, we have notable differences. And so look at the LOS. So explain capital asset pricing model and the security market line. And then, of course, there's got to be a question about uh, comparing those differences. All right. So CML only applies to portfolios on the efficient frontier. Boy, we said that earlier that that CML is the efficient frontier. 
SML applies to any security, whether it is efficient or not. That's probably a really good thing to memorize for the exam. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example. So here we have a bunch of input data in the question stem, risk-free rate five, standard deviation 40 of the individual security, 20 of the market, market return 10%. So let's go ahead and find beta. So let's take 80% times 0.4 over 0.2. That gets us the 1.6. Then what we can do is we can use, we can use that beta of 1.6 in the capital asset pricing model. And if you do the uh, equation, you get 13% using the capital asset pricing model. Boy, at the risk of offending you, I'm gonna go ahead and say this. I say this to my students all the time. Uh, you know, they're 20 years old. You guys are, what, 25, 35, 30? No, I bet how many of you are 60 out there <laughs> like I am? So I want you to don't, I want you not to violate the uh, distributive property of mathematics. So uh, do the uh, uh, do the parentheses first. So do 10 minus 5 equals 5. Then multiply that by 1.6 and you get 8. And then you add the 5 and you get the 13. Because with some calculators, if you do 5 plus 1.6 times 10 minus 5, you'll get the wrong answer. All right, how about applications of capital asset pricing model and the security market line? This is really important. So let's let's talk about security selection first. So this is what we know about the security market line. Are you ready? This is the line that represents all fairly priced securities. Now, does that mean that all securities will fall directly on the security market line? And the answer is yes, if you believe all of those assumptions that we just talked about in those previous slides. But if some of those assumptions are not perfectly available and applied to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, then you might find stocks that don't fall on the security market line. And let's face it, as good financial analysts, this is what our goal is. Our goal is to find undervalued and overvalued securities so we can use the capital asset pricing model and its graphic illustration, the security market line, to find those things. So look at the green star. Boy, do we like that green star. Yes, we would love to find stocks that are at the green star because the security market line would tell us for that beta, we can only reasonably expect to get something very less than that expected return. So we love, we love those stocks that are green stars. We call those undervalued. And so what's gonna happen? Well, this is the genius of William Sharp. The genius is that if that green star stock exists and you and I find it, what are we going to do? We're going to tell all of our clients that this is an undervalued stock. So what do they do? They run to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and they bid up the price of that share, right? Lots and lots of buying is going to increase the value, which as you remember from your simple time value of money stuff, means that the return, the expected return falls. So that undervalued security might be undervalued for a short time period until all of us who are aware of its undervaluation drive the price up, drive the expected return down until it falls directly on the security market line. Let's go over to the red star. Do we like the red star? No, we don't like that stock at all. We don't want to buy that stock because we're only getting way less expected return than what the SML and the capital asset pricing model predicts. So we don't like that stock. In fact, we tell all of our clients, you see that stock out there? That's a stinky stock. Don't buy it. And if it fits your risk return objective, let's go ahead and short that stock. We want to let's sell, sell, sell. So what happens on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange? Nobody's buying that stock. The price falls and the expected return rises until it falls directly on that security market line. So do you see, among all the reasons that William Sharp won the Nobel Prize in economics for the capital asset pricing model, that this is a good reason as well, that if there are under or overvalued stocks, 
that they're not going to be overvalued and undervalued for a long time because really smart men and women are going to drive the price up or down and all stocks will eventually in the long term fall directly on the security market line. So here's what I tell my students uh, on the exam and this is what I'll tell you. Remember, if the stock falls over, over the SML, it's undervalued. If it falls under the SML, it is overvalued. Now, we can also apply capital asset pricing model to portfolio constructions. Ah, what we're going to do is we're going to try to replicate the market portfolio. Oh, boy, have you guys watched the derivative securities recordings that I made? If not, go back to those, go to those recordings and see how important replication is. So what we're going to try to do here is something just a little bit similar, not identical to that. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at a positive alpha and a negative alpha. And we're going to say something like, look, if we have a positive alpha, that means that the performance of our security or our portfolio is higher than the market portfolio. So we want to add those to our portfolio. Negative alphas, we want to exclude those. Now, what we could also do is use those to under or overweight positive alphas and negative alphas. Now, this is not really part of this reading, but we do get to this in level three, is that uh, a lot of times mutual funds that have positive alphas, uh, they turn negative. You, you don't hardly ever see an actively managed mutual fund that has a positive alpha for hundreds of years. Maybe that's called reversion to the mean. Oh my gosh, Jim, that was a great link to, uh, to a different LOS. All right, so remember what I said earlier that capital asset pricing model is not perfect. So what, what are its limitations? Ah, this is what I was saying earlier. The true market portfolio consists of all assets. And what did I say earlier? I said something like collectibles. Well, that's not really a traditional uh, financial asset. But of, of course, lots of people think of their homes as, an inv uh, as a part of the market portfolio. And so you can't really go out and invest in somebody else's house, like a house down the street if you really like that house. I mean, you can buy a mortgage-backed security, but suppose that house doesn't have a mortgage. Well, you know, you're kind of left out there. This is what I was saying earlier as well. We like the S&P 500 index. Maybe we like the Vanguard uh, Global Stock Market Index. Maybe we like the QQQ. You know, there are different proxies for different market portfolios. Uh, what, what did I say about my dissertation? Some of them had negative betas. Some had betas that were exceeding uh, two. I even had one beta that was like a 3.5. He had a long history of returns. Investors are unlikely to have homogeneous expectations. Of course, of course, we all think differently. Now, you know, maybe there's a herd mentality and that's part of behavioral issues, but we're not going to. Boy, what was that definition of homogeneous expectations? We all process the information the same way. We accurately identify the relevant portions of all of that information, and we all arrive at the same conclusion. Well, that doesn't hardly ever happen in anything uh, as evidenced by watching uh, an NBA playoff game with my son and his friends. Uh, they were all rooting for the Celtics, but they all came up with different reasons why the Celtics lost. Ah, here we go. Sharp. Trainer, M squared, Jensen's alpha. So these are performance measures, performance evaluation measures that ask the following question. They say something like, all right, look, we've done all this stuff in part one and part two, and we have crafted our portfolio. Well, how well have we done? So we're going to use Sharp and Trainer. These things are super, super similar. Notice that they are identical with the exception of the denominator. So William Sharp said something like, let's divide that market risk premium, the return on the portfolio minus the risk free rate in the numerator by standard deviation. So this is total risk. Remember Sharp as total risk in his ratio. So look at the third, no, the fourth uh, arrow point. Portfolios with the highest Sharp ratio has the best performance. So the Institute, you, you guys look at the uh, those end of the reading, multiple choices. They have a table and they have different uh, 
portfolio returns and a risk-free return and a, and a, a portfolio standard deviation. And they'll ask you which one has the highest sharp ratio. So you'll have to calculate it to be able to, uh, to go ahead and, uh, and identify which portfolio is superior or boy, make sure you answer this question, which portfolio is inferior? I remember when I was on the exam, and I know uh, as part of the uh, professional standards, we shouldn't talk about uh, the exam, but I, I think, you know, I took it 20 years ago. I remember there was one question about uh, superior versus inferior. And when I went through and ans answered it the first time, I selected whichever one was the opposite. I can't remember exactly. So my point is make sure you read the question, take your pencil and underline, you know, inferior or superior. Uh, trainer ratio, tra ratio, same thing, except we're dividing by beta uh, in, in the denominator. And so what do we have? We know standard deviation is going to be positive for the sharp ratio because it's the square root of the variance, but we could have this potential of a negative beta. So if you have a negative beta, then, you know, just take trainer ratio and set it aside. Remember when we had our corporate finance reading, we talked about this guy, uh, these two guys, uh, Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller, and we talked about the M&M capital structure and dividend policy irrelevance. Well, Franco Modigli Modigliani and his granddaughter are the two M's. So this is, this is M squared. And so I want you to just, before we look at the equation, just look down at the bottom arrow point. Uh, a portfolio that matches the return of the market portfolio will have an M squared equal to zero. So this is where we get to evaluate replication or mimicking of market portfolios. If we're a passive investor and this is what we want to do, then we should have an M squared equal to zero. But if we're actively managing our funds, then we want to have a positive M squared. And look in the very middle, there's the equation. So it looks an awful lot like stuff that we have been doing, right? return on the portfolio minus the risk free rate. And there are standard deviations of the market, standard deviations of the portfolio, and there's, uh, and there's the risk free rate of interest. And, uh, you know, this, this portfolio, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, M squared ratio is really kind of a scaled version of the sharp ratio. And so it's probably going to agree with the sharp rankings all the time. But what it will do is it will give you a sense of leverage inside of the portfolio that the sharp ratio cannot. And then Jensen's alpha, uh, this is Michael Jensen, and this is really just a super cool thing. Notice uh, in the brackets, we have the capital asset pricing model, which you ready for this, which is the expected return on a portfolio or an individual stock. Notice what we have to the left of the minus sign and to the right of the equal sign. There's the actual return on the portfolio. So Jensen's alpha can be uh, summarized as just the difference between what an investor or a fund manager expects to get out of the portfolio based on capital asset pricing model and what was actually performed. Difference between expected and actual return. And so what do we want? We want to outperform the market. So we want positive alphas. And one of the cool things about Jensen's alpha is that let's suppose we're uh, evaluating five uh, mutual fund managers and four of them have positive alphas and one has negative. So we throw the negative uh, alpha out. And what we can do is we can rank those portfolios based on their alphas and their absolute values. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, and do some calculations here. So we've got uh, a table up here. So 13.9, 8.5, 1.4 beta, and some standard devi a standard deviation and a return on the market. So there's the sharp ratio uh, of 1 to 2. There's the trainer ratio of 074. Now, remember that the LOS asks you to go ahead and calculate, but part of that interpretation might be for you to identify which one is superior or inferior. So make sure you pick the higher sharp and the higher trainer ratio. Uh, here we can throw the M squared ratio. There's 18 and there's the Jensen's alpha of 4.38. And that takes us through this. Uh, I think I got through this slide deck in a much shorter fashion than part one. Uh, 
But I think you're better off thinking of part one and part two as kind of one big part because what we're doing is we're starting with, you know, something super simple. What did we start with? The holding period return back in the beginning of part one. And what did we end up with? We ended up with these performance measures. And so I'm going to go ahead and probably not make your life any easier, easier as a good academic. I'm going to say something like, boy, you ought to know all these things because these are these are really great exam questions. So thank you for watching and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and good luck studying.